Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is April 8th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone enjoyed their weekend. Glad to be back with you today. So let's get to some of the economic news today. With the S&P up three points, the Dow was down 84 points, the NASDAQ closed up 15, and the Russell 2000, the small cap index, closed down for the day three and a half points. Oil continues its rally to the upside and now sits at $64.50 a barrel. Gold still remains around our $1,300 level, I said to be on the lookout for it. Now sits at $1,303 an ounce, and silver now sits at $15.23 an ounce. Meanwhile, the 10-year Treasury continues its ascent and now sits at 2.52%, 2.52% on the 10-year Treasury bond. Now, getting back to oil... It continues its rally, $64.50 a barrel. Why? Well, we continue to have our international crises. We have the issue with Venezuela, which is starting to become just a melting pot of world powers. You have 50 Western nations saying that, well, Guaido is really the president of Venezuela, Meanwhile, you have Maduro, his regime is still in power, and you have his members in their government saying, look, Guaido, his immunity agreement is basically shredded, so his life could be on the line. These are some issues. Not only that, you now have Russia in Venezuela, you now have Chinese in Venezuela, and of course the Russians and the Chinese are not siding with the United States and the other Western countries who say that Maduro's got to go. So what's going to happen? Are we going to go to war over this? Is this going to be a major battle? Is this a proxy war? What's going on here? What is taking place? Of course, all the poor little Venezuelans. We're only worried about any poor little people because they're walking atop a huge amount of natural resources. In this case, it happens to be almost the mother load of oil and natural gas. And it's very good oil and natural gas. There's different grades. There's everything, okay? Venezuela has some good stuff down there. Not the poor little people. It's just that the poor little people happen to be standing on top of oil and natural gas reserves. If they weren't, nobody would care unless it had some other sort of strategic natural resource or was geographically well positioned. Otherwise, they wouldn't care whatever took place down there, okay? Maybe it would be a talking point under what type of regime was there. Maybe a capitalist is going to complain about socialism down there, this, that, or the other. It just would have been a talking point. It wouldn't have been anything of major import. But the fact that it is oil and gas, well, we got to be there. And now you have the Russians involved. Now you have the Chinese involved. In the midst, remind you, of a U.S.-China trade talk that we're told is going swimmingly well. Of course, it's not. Otherwise, it would have been done by now, as we were told it's the best thing ever. I mean, the way that this deal remains the best thing ever is for the deal to actually never get done. Because then, once people actually start looking at it, they're going to say, well, ooh, I don't know. This might not be the best deal ever. Buy the rumor, sell the fact. It's what we've been talking about on this program for a long time now. And as you know, I'm getting very sick and tired of talking about it. But it's in the news almost on a daily basis. If the market is stumbling a little bit, up oh, here comes Larry Kudlow. Here comes another economic advisor. Here comes the president himself either via Twitter or when he's talking to reporters, well, the U.S.-China trade talks are going fine. They're going great. We're going to have a deal here soon. Well, now we're told it's not until 2025. 2025 is what we're told is how long the Chinese will have to come into compliance with whatever deal is struck. 2025. The president, even if he wins re-election, will not be the president in 2025. So what mechanism is going to exist for the Chinese to say, all right, we're going to comply with all of this stuff. Not to mention, I told you guys, you have to watch out. If we make a deal with them, and the example I gave was American farmers getting more business, which, okay, is a good thing for American farmers and and for those communities, but at what expense? At what expense? Because just because you sign a deal doesn't mean you now have greater demand in China for more wheat, was the example I gave. One million bushels of wheat. Again, just made up numbers. But if that's the total demand for wheat in China, well, okay, we're going to start buying more from the U.S., but at the expense of who? My example was the Russians and the Brazilians. Well, what does that mean? Are the Russians and Brazilians just going to lay over? 
play dead, say, oh, well, yeah, we were outdone, the Americans got us on a deal, or you think they're going to fight for their respective economies and for their respective farmers. Will this go to the WTO or somebody else to say, hey, look, come on, we got good wheat, we had these agreements, you know, you can't just cut us off now so you can go with the Americans. I mean, this isn't fair. Don't we want fair and free trade and all this stuff? I mean, come on. So these are ty the types of problems that can and most likely will ensue, regardless of whether or not this is the best deal ever struck. These are the things you have to pay attention to. It's not just political promises. There's reality to this stuff. And that's why this deal has not been done. Also, because the president foolishly, foolishly has taken ownership of this economy and the stock market. And the Chinese know this very, very well. Very, very well. So there hasn't been an increase in tariffs. In fact, the threat of increasing tariffs on Chinese goods has been basically removed from the table because we were so close to getting a deal. And as a sign of good faith, the president said we're going to postpone those additional 15% tariffs on additional Chinese goods. We're not going to do it because we're so close to a deal. Uh, maybe that's true, but I also think it's a lot of the president knowing that if he did that, the stock market would go down. To what degree, I do not know, but it would go down. And it probably wouldn't be by a small amount, just depending on how big it, it goes down would be the question. Because the war would be, the trade war would be seen as escalating, which is not a good thing. More uncertainty. The markets don't like the uncertainty. It's going to be dragged out even further. The Chinese knew this, so they played him. He boxed himself in. The president boxed himself in by taking ownership of this economy and this stock market. Foolish move. Foolish move. Did not have to do it. Did not have to do it. Now he's dancing. Now he's dancing. He so supposedly called for a weaker dollar, which he did. He did call for a weaker dollar at CPAC. He's calling for the Federal Reserve through his mouth and that of his surrogates, Stephen Moore, who he wants to nominate to the Federal Reserve, and Larry Kudlow, his economic advisor, that the Federal Reserve must immediately cut interest rates by 50 basis points. Immediately. For what purpose? I thought we were in the midst of an economic miracle. The best economy ever. You lower interest rates in times of trouble in times of trouble, and we're going to get to quantitative easing here shortly, but staying on this discussion with the China trade talks and how this is all related, and with the weaker dollar, with oil prices, I mean, the president wants lower oil prices, he was out there tweeting to OPEC, keep the oil pumping, we can't have it, why? Because he knows that he has taken ownership of this economy and this stock market. The American consumer had low oil and gasoline prices late last year, basically through the third and fourth quarter of 2018. Now you're seeing a reversal of that because oil has rallied, gone to the moon, basically. I think it's been like a 40% uh, rally over the past few months here. And now you have geopolitical tensions that are just fanning the flames. It's fueling this fire to the upside. So you have WTI, which is at, again, $64.5 a barrel, but you have Brent which is getting closer and closer to 70. So, I mean, this is not good for the consumer if they got to pay more at the pump. So that's what's coming. So again, you have the president at odds with himself. He wants a weaker dollar, but that, you know, oil is traded in dollars, so it's going to take more dollars to buy oil. That's just how it works. All right, again, if he can pull off that magic trick and get a weaker dollar and weaker oil prices, more power to him. But so far, it doesn't seem to be working. Now, on to quantitative easing four. I mean, weren't we supposed to be in, is in the midst of an economic miracle? Quantitative easing, ladies and gentlemen, is an emergency measure. This trick, this ploy, this fraudulent economic policy was put on us in the midst of the 0809 financial crisis financial crisis. That's when this came to be. Are we in the midst of a financial crisis? I thought this was the best economy ever. That's what we're told from this president, his White House, Larry Kudlow, and a whole bunch of other talking mouths on CNBC and Bloomberg and everybody who just wants everybody to buy, buy, buy. Nobody wants to have a real conversation with you. 
even tell you about the other side of the story. If you want to be a bull, that's fine. Be a bull. If you think everything's fine, great. But at least give the audience some context. Give them some flavor. Give them the other side of the story. Let some bears go out there. Or just let some people who are more or less realists out there and say, well, what about, okay, you make your case for the bull market to continue. All right, well, what about this? Well, what about that? And what about this and that? How do you answer for these? I mean, these are legitimate questions that people should be contemplating before they make a decision in anything. You should want to have as much information as possible. I listen to the bull market analysts and people who are the proponents of that, who are people who are saying, yep, I'm a bull, everything's going up, everything's fine, you don't got to worry about a thing, we can gloss over it, you got the tax cuts, you got the Federal Reserve here, you got the ECB here, you got the People's Bank of China here, you got the Bank of Japan, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, everything's just going to be go up, 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 everything's going to be rosy. But then here is the Capital News Podcast and a whole host of others out there who say, well, what about all this debt? Why isn't anybody having a conversation on valuations. Why isn't anybody having a conversation on the national debt, on our most recent budget that was just put out there, in our deficits that are going to be trillion dollar plus, in a great economy, according to you and others like you? You don't have trillion dollar deficits in a great economy. You just don't. So now you have the president out there saying, not only do you need to cut interest rates, but now you also have to have the Federal Reserve continue quantitative easing and go to the next leg. Quantitative easing number four. We had one, two, and three. Now he wants to go to number four. Didn't work out that well, one, two, and three. That's why they had to keep going up and up because it wasn't working. It wasn't enough because they didn't allow this market and this economy to properly deleverage all of the malinvestment that took place that led to the 0809 financial crisis. The world over was not allowed to delever. That's the cure, folks. That's the cure. That would have been the cure. It would have been solved by now. But nope, can't do it. Politicians don't want to be blamed. Central bankers don't want to be blamed. The crony banks and a whole bunch of other corporations who are in the midst of all of this, who were at fault in all of this, didn't want to be blamed. But everybody, all of them got bailed out. You didn't get bailed out. You lost your home. You lost your car. You lost your job. And in the midst of it, you might have lost your family. You might have lost your family. Financial stress causes a whole host of problems, personally. People get divorced, families separate, a whole bunch of things. But everybody else got bailed out. The banks who caused it committed fraud. Well, here, here's hundreds of billions of dollars. Here's trillions of dollars if you actually look at the numbers. You got billions from the taxpayers. You got trillions from the Federal Reserve and other central banks. I mean, you can't make it up. This is what they do. And then they have the audacity and the nerve to come out and say, look, Everything's fine because the banks are fine. They fund my campaign. They take care of me. So, yeah, everything's fine. You'll find another house. There'll be another job for you. Cars, dime a dozen. You can go get them. No problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. We had the discussion last week in regards to the monetary base, and we looked against the uh, Wilshire 5000 total stock market. We indexed them. We looked back at the at the... Recession, when this whole thing started, when quantitative easing started, we said, well, let's look at these graphs. Let's overlay them. What did we see? That this entire stock market has been bought for by central bankers. That's quantitative easing. And now you have a president who knows this. You have a president who's taken ownership of this economy and the stock market, and he doesn't want to lose re-election. He doesn't want to be a president up for re-election in the midst of a recession, some sort of economic slowdown, and most definitely not a major stock market correction or bear market. Doesn't want to happen. So he said, oh, well, look, if the Fed prints money, the stock market goes up. So yeah, 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 I own this thing because I'm a fool. I said this. I don't know why I did it, but I did it because I'm egotistical. I'm so vain. I just have to take credit for all the good things, but I'm going to blame everybody else for the bad. Poor leadership, folks. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And now he's calling for the Federal Reserve to embark on quantitative easing number four. Number four. Because he wants the stock market to continue its ascent. He wants it to continue its rally. At the same time, mind you, he's starting to dance and starting to blame the Federal Reserve for the economy being slower than what it otherwise would have been if they weren't messing around with everything. 
So the solution, get back in and start messing around with everything on the other side. Because you did it for Obama for eight years, you can do it for me. That's the argument. So when is that ever going to end? Because that logic is, well, there's going to be somebody else as our president, whether that's in come 2020 or thereafter, we will have another president. I mean, logically speaking, when will that argument ever cease to exist? Well, you did it for Obama. You did it for Trump. Keep printing money because now you got crazy Bernie in there, God forbid, or somebody else. Keep the printing presses going. This isn't capitalism, ladies and gentlemen. Money from a printing press is not capitalism. Again, one of the largest, if not the largest, transfers of wealth in human history has occurred over this last decade. This is why you have populism all over the world, because this has benefited the upper echelons at the expense of the middle and the lower echelons. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's how it works. That's how it works. We talk about it on the show all the time. Check out my book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. We go through it step by step. We talk about the fraudulent nature of central banking. We talk about fractional reserve banking. Creating loans and money out of thin air, out of nothing. It's just a ledger. It's just a bank ledger. It's all on paper. Yet if things go wrong, you lose and they get bailed out. It's a fraud. This ain't right. This is the real world in which we live. People don't know this. They don't, they don't pay attention. They're more worried about what their star on Instagram is doing or what's happening on Facebook or what sports team is drafting who for how much money to chase a ball around. You want to focus on those types of issues? You're going to get what you deserve. The problem is there are people who are paying attention and want to do the right thing to help people who aren't paying attention, who are getting it that don't deserve it. And that's what bothers me. I don't care if you want to vote for a whole bunch of things. Go ahead and vote for them. But don't reach into my pocket to pay for them. Especially if I don't want them. I don't endorse it. If you want it, go for it. But do not. Do not reach into my pocket and a whole bunch of other people who don't believe with it, who don't endorse it, and don't want to pay for it. You have your issues that you are worried about and you want to take care of? Go. Go do it. I have mine. Other people have theirs. This reaching in other people's pockets, this telling people what to do, this is the problem. This is all coming together. Because people know, again, instinctively, they might not be able to put their finger on it specifically and identify the culprit in the federal government, in your state government, in your local government, or at the Federal Reserve or other central banks the world over. But people know that something is wrong. They know something's wrong. If everything was great and fantastic over the past eight years, Hillary Clinton would be the president. But she isn't. She's a terrible candidate, obviously. But if everything was so good under Obama, hey, people should have wanted it to continue. They didn't. They said, wow, something's not right here. We need this system to be shaken up. In walks Donald Trump. Something was amiss over in Europe, and specifically in the UK. People never saw it happening, but boom, there it is. Brexit took place, and we talk about that all the time. And that's still in shambles. So there we are. Those are the crossroads. That's what's taking place. The president's trying to bob and weave. He's trying to get himself out of the box he put himself in by taking ownership of this economy in the stock market. Now he has to dodge a major bullet for the next two years. Either an economic slowdown, a recession, and or some sort of significant pullback in the stock market. He has to dodge that for the next two and a half years. Or I'm sorry, next year and a half. Until November of 2020. I mean, that's really stretching it. He didn't have to do this to himself. Again, I think there are a couple things he can do. He can dance himself out of this with blaming the Federal Reserve to some degree. He will be able to do that specifically with his base and some others, independents and even some Democrats who understand the Federal Reserve and really don't want it. And this is a good platform, an opportunity for the president to address the nation and to educate the nation as to what the Federal Reserve does, who they are, blah, blah, blah. That's part of the problem. It's the education. Nobody knows what the Federal Reserve is. Nobody knows who these people are, what they do. Not the vast majority of people in this country. I mean, come on, be real with yourself. They don't. People don't know. The people at the Federal Reserve don't even know what they're doing. So, I mean, we have one problem after the other. Now, on top of that, so the president can get himself out of this by pot potentially blaming the Federal Reserve, which he's already in the midst of doing. 
somehow he may be able to convince them to cut interest rates or embark on quantitative easing number four. Again, that really throws the whole idea of independence, the Federal Reserve being an independent agency out the window because they're just doing the bidding of the president. So that won't look good for them. Of course, their credibility is out the window with the Capitol News. We know this, but it'll just be right in your face. Well, it's a political organization now because they're doing the bidding of the president. And if you follow the political geopolitical podcast, we talk about the two-tier justice system. Well, if the president can truly drain the swamp and name names and declassify documents that puts people in the hot seat, maybe behind bars, at least gives them their day in court for the American people to see what's going on, that might save him too. Because then he could say, well, look, I'm here to drain the swamp. And I didn't know it was going to be this deep and dark and all of these people in government and in business and all this stuff, everybody got wrapped up in it. And then you just have a, a collapse because there's so much uncertainty and everybody's just got their, 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 their jaws on the floor because they can't believe it. I didn't know that it was just corrupt. We got a $4 trillion government every year that's spending money and you didn't know this was corrupt? $4 trillion? Give me a break. You think every penny's accounted for? Wake up. Now, the other news I want to get to before it gets too far behind us, because Friday I was off, but we had our jobs report, right? So total non-farm payroll employment increased by 196,000 jobs in March, which beat estimates of 170 or 180,000 180, jobs, which was predicted, with notable gains in health care and in professional and technical services. Employment growth averaged 180,000 per month in the first quarter of 2019, compared with 223,000 per month in 2018. So a decline year over year on the average of 43,000 per month. Now, healthcare added 49,000 jobs in March and 398,000 over the past 12 months. Over the month, employment increased in ambulatory healthcare services, hospitals, and nursing and residential care facilities. Now, we also had uh, employment in professional and technical services grew by 34,000 in March and 311,000 over the past 12 months. Now, if we look at employment in construction, it showed little change, up 16,000, but has increased by 246,000 over the past 12 months. In manufacturing, employment changed little for the second month in a row, declined 6,000 in March following a 1,000 job gain in February. In the 12 months prior to February, manufacturing had added an average of 22,000 jobs per month. Within the industry, employment in motor vehicles and parts declined in March, again, down 6,000 jobs. Now, I was able to watch some of the financial media on Friday a little bit. Uh, obviously, they talked about this being a, a more solid report because it was obviously better than February. You have to recall February... We only saw a gain of 20,000 jobs in February. And everybody said, oh, well, that's just a glitch. There's no way. We are in the midst of an economic miracle. There's no way. It's just 20,000 jobs. It's a glitch. It's excuse after excuse. It's the weather. It's cold outside. It's the partial government shutdown. It's just a glitch. Well, you know, everybody was waiting for the uh, revision. And they were waiting to see 100,000 jobs, 150, 160. See, we told you it was just a glitch. Something was wrong. Well, it was revised up. It was revised up to 33,000. So you had 20,000, and it was revised up to 33,000. So it wasn't good. So again, I was able to watch some of the financial media on Friday, and nobody really discussed this because it wasn't the talking point that everybody was hoping for, that it was going to be a huge revision, that it was just a glitch in the data. Well, it wasn't. So again... It's not just what they're telling you, it's what they're not telling you. They want you to see what they want you to see. They want you to hear what they want you to hear. One side of the story. At least here you get both. Maybe I'm too lopsided, too, too much dead into the downside, but I'm just that's just my analysis. I honestly think that that is going to unfold and it's not going to be pretty. If I'm a year early, I don't care. If I'm two years early, I don't care. Once you start going out further and further, then, yeah, I have some problems with what's going on. Okay, I mean, I'll admit that. All right, because some people have been saying this is going to be a problem years and years ago. All right, and you haven't seen it. That wasn't me. I'm simply at the point where saying this market is saturated with debt. It's at every level, consumer, corporate, governmental, everything. Federal level, state level local level, central banks running wild, 
federal governments, depending where you are, running wild. Every, I mean, stock markets on a tear, especially the U.S. market, which has been completely reflated and inflated. It's false. It's fake. It's a bubble. It's not going to end well. The sooner this thing corrects, the better off we'll all be. The further and further we kick it down the road, the worse off we're all going to be. So I guess, again, I have to fall back on some of my optimism and hopefulness that the market takes grab a hold of all of this and says enough's enough and we have our correction. Again, it will not, it will not be pleasant, but it is most definitely needed. So we're going to continue these conversations. There was a CBS interview yesterday of Ray Dalio. Again, Ray Dalio is the manager and founder of the largest hedge fund in the world, Bridgewater Associates. And he was on 60 Minutes, and he had a conversation about capitalism and how capitalism needs reformed. I'm not going to go in that today, but we are going to talk about it later this week because I also believe he posted an article on LinkedIn, which I am going to look at, and I'm sure I have every intention, at least from what I've heard from Mr. Dalio, that I will be challenging his argument because, in my opinion, capitalism does not need to be reformed. Free market capitalism needs to be brought back. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you. As always, please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, and I'll catch you guys next time. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.